David, uh, how did it uh, uh, come about? It came, I know, from the, the gentleman who has a cold and is not with us. It did. Um, in early 2013, right after I'd had uh, a feature at Sundance for the first time, I was sent this article from The New Yorker called The Old Man, The Gun, along with a note asking if I'd be interested in meeting with Mr. Redford to discuss adapting it. Uh, and based on the fact that you called him Mr. Redford, I'm going to guess you did not uh, you did not know him at this point. I did not know him. I had been in the same had room with him. Had you heard of him? I had seen Captain America. <laughs> his, his most famous film, yes. of course, right? Yeah. Um, Sorry, go on. But... Uh, I don't really remember too much of that first meeting because I was, well, I was definitely starstruck. <laughs> and, uh, but I do, we talked about, you know, being from Texas, which is where I'm from and where he's from. And um, we talked about the story, I'm sure, at some point in there. <laughs> but, um, you know, the next day I uh, sat down to start writing it and was writing it with him in mind every step of the way. As long as you mention writing it with him in mind every step of the way, the, the, the New Yorker article, which is a, a wonderful read, um, there is no uh, love interest. There is no jewel in the story. So who did you have in mind as you wrote that part into your film? She's sitting right here. <laughs> um, there, there was a, a character in the story whom, like a, a, a wealthy widow character who he married in real life. The real force sucker like, within a span, span of a few months met, wooed, and married this woman whose name was Jewel. And one of the great details of that uh, relationship, I, actually the only detail that really comes through in the story is that she, A, said she never realized what he did, really did for a living, but also she was really wealthy. So he married into a very wealthy country club lifestyle and yet couldn't stop robbing banks. Um, which I thought, I, I, I thought that said a lot about him, but I wanted the jewel in our film to do more than that. I wanted her to go toe-to-toe -to -toe and, and, you know, really sort of give him an opportunity to, to pursue something else, to go down a different path, and then to, as per the real story, not do that. And when I was writing it, um, I, I always like to write for actors that I know, and sometimes I take the, the risky chance of writing one for someone I don't know, but who I really want to work with. And so thankfully... Uh, you liked it. <laughs> so you wrote it for Sissy, and you'd, you'd never met her either? Nope. But I was from Texas. I mean, yeah, we basically, we basically are neighbors. So then, Sissy, how, how, did, that, uh, how did it come to you? How did you uh, uh, receive this work? You, did we meet first, and then w we Skyped? We Skyped. We, we, I don't think we actually met in person until you came to location. But we had Skyped and talked on the phone. And, uh, and all the things that people do in modern times. Did, had I read the script before you? I think so, because we talked about the jewelry store scene. I remember like right. right from the very beginning, we talked about that, and you gave me a great bit of advice about how to make it much better, which I thankfully took. Don't steal the bracelet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, be a good person. Oh, so you changed that. that you, originally, she goes along with... The it was originally, I, I wanted Jewel to have a moment where she participates in the thrill of it, and... I didn't have the foresight to realize that the scene needed to continue and that Forrest needed to be put in his place and realize how to be a responsible, mature human being. And Sissy illuminated that for me. I think, I think he liked Jewel a lot better after that. You know, she beat him at his own game so, and got the bracelet. So, uh, Sissy, before I, I move on to the other panelists here, you, um, you had met... Uh, your co-star uh, in this film, but you guys had never acted together right. and you had no personal relationship. Right. And the wonderful thing was, was that we shot all of Jules, uh, most of hers, all, I think, except one scene at the very end of the movie. We shot it in the beginning of the filming when it was just us there. And so we, our relationship, we, we got to know each other on film and it, it, through the scene, so it, it really got to unfold, and that's something that rarely happens, getting to shoot in pretty much in sequence. Tika, what was your experience then on this uh, uh, production with uh, th three, uh, three Academy Award winners and this rising acclaimed, I, I've never used the word acclaimed out loud, <laughs> and I just did it, uh, and <laughs> this uh, rising heralded uh, director? Yeah, it was surreal. Um, I just remember sitting in the diner at the diner and 
we're just all in these booths and I'm just looking around like, holy hell, like <laughs> they all won an Academy Award and it was just amazing. But I came in and it was literally like a family. I've never worked with David before, obviously as a director and he was just so welcoming of our ideas and Casey and I never met either. So he didn't know if there would be chemistry but he made it so pretty good guess. <laughs> and he made it so they both made it so comfortable and inclusive um, of my ideas and Casey's ideas that the family actually felt lived in and it felt like it was real. And um, I think we accomplished something there. Uh, may I just say that, I, you know, a movie set like despite being here at the Academy, I have to say that once you get on a movie set, no matter what awards people have or whatever, how many great movies they've been in, it is all pretty quickly forgotten and you're just sort of looking and dealing with the other person that's there. And um, Tika's being modest, I think. She came in and completely just owned the set and those scenes and, and brought our storyline to life in a really great way. Uh, so I don't think you ever she ever, ever really was thinking about other people's <laughs> careers. She was like, oh no, not once I started taking acting. over the movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, once I started acting, it was like you know it, to watch Bob like read a newspaper and Sissy was just like <laughs> laughing and everybody was just being normal human beings. It was like oh cool, they're people. So uh, big advantage of this movie, Lisa, as you and David are putting it together. Uh, I learned uh, upstairs moments ago, Robert Redford almost in the same outfit the entire movie. Uh, David had this brilliant idea of dressing Bob in a blue suit through the entire film, maybe changing a tie or something like that. We had like uh, my my wonderful costume designer Anel Broder, who had like an entire series of like slightly different blue suits, depending on you know the mood or the tone, and the tie would change, and like the the shirts would sometimes be tea stained or not, mm -hmm. and often I'd just be like we can't ask him to go change, like, let's just keep shooting. <laughs> but uh, but what that gave us was total freedom in terms of the editorial process of moving scenes around, restructuring, a lot of things went back, many things went back to the way that they were originally written, but it gave us the freedom to experiment in a way that you normally can't do. You can with visual effects, you can change certain kinds of things, I've done that before, added a skirt, you know, done a shirt, but this was just very organic in terms of being able to really find the true structure of the movie. And the other thing I want to say is that it was really interesting that we did, which is highly unusual. We worked without music for most of the editorial process, which is really unusual. And but I not think for me. Pardon? Not unusual for me. Right. <laughs> but unfortunately, we had done Pete's Dragon. We had done this huge temp score and stuff like that. So it was a really wonderful discovery for me to be able to find the rhythms of the scene without, you know, music telling you what to do. You liked that? That was... Oh, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It's a way to find out what the movie is before you start finishing it because like music is an amazing tool but if I find that if you put it in too early you start to lean on it and I would rather let the movie like inform me of its own rhythm before we start trying to augment or illuminate that rhythm with with music. Sissy you make a lot of cozy movies um the uh so I want to know for, for all you guys but but so you know the other narrative that developed here and 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 he wishes he could take it back that it was announcing that it was Redford's last movie as an actor and so it's interesting that I'm in a sense this is now I'm glad he's not here I'm tired of the, <laughs> I'm tired of that guy um uh but uh that that narrative developed during the production right you became aware not in the first part but when you're shooting that maybe this was going to be his final it was during prep that he had an, he had done an interview, and I can't remember where it was, but it started to pop up on my phone, like <laughs> Robert Redford just announced his retirement. Yeah, and he's like over there eating a sandwich or yeah. re reading the paper. <laughs> yeah. um, so it was definitely something we were aware of as a possibility, and I just instantly just was like, I'm not going to think about that, because otherwise it'll just inform everything I'm doing to a degree that I think would be unhelpful for the film. You just like, I didn't want to go through every scene thinking, well, that's the last time Robert Redford's ever gonna like get out of a car in a movie. <laughs> um, that's the last time he's gonna hang up a payphone. Right. <laughs> he, he uses payphones like nobody else. I nobody, wanna, nobody I, better yeah. on a telephone than Robert um, Redford in a movie. And yeah. uh, and so I just didn't think about it at all, ever. But then once we, you know, finished the film and and 
And then certainly in the past few weeks, as he's talked about it more, it certainly has been something that has been on my mind. And as a fan, I certainly hope he keeps acting. If he decides that he's going to move into other territory, as he talks about, wanting to direct and produce more and, and focus on his, his other interests, then I certainly understand it. But, you know, for me as some, a fan who grew up watching him as an actor, I, I don't want to ever have the opportunity to not see a new Robert Redford movie. Sissy, did uh, you, your, you know, if it is his final movie, this is, you were the, you were the love interest. You were I the, got the last kiss. You got the last <laughs> kiss. Um, so did this story break while you guys were still shooting your scenes or? You know, I, I don't remember. It was, it was, bef it was like in November of, of the fateful November of 2016. So, we Why? What else happened? Though? I can't remember. I remember. It was I got I got really distracted by yeah. this retirement. Remember, there was a Thanksgiving. That yeah. was, was a good one. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we were in prep. We were like location scouting at that point. So it was before anyone had gotten to town. And, and I think by the time we started shooting a few months later, it had receded to the point where we didn't ever have to talk about it. 